Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another edition of our webinar series, Inside Immigration. Today, we're joined by panelists at Green and Spiegel, Kelly Goldthorpe and Claire McLean. Please feel free to ask any questions via the pop-up text bar on the right side of your screen, and we'll do our best to address them at the end of the webinar. If the panelists do not get your question, you can contact them through the information provided on screen now. And with that being said, I'm going to hand things over to our panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to June 28th. Can't believe that it's uh, mid-year already of 2022, but uh, here we are, and it's a it's a packed schedule today. So I'm going to just get started right away. So I'm going to talk about some temporary residence updates. Um, one being the International Mobility Program um, for Quebec, which now allows um, Quebec skilled workers with pending PR applications to apply for a work permit from outside of Canada, provided that they hold a CSQ under the regular skilled worker or AI pilot program. Now there's an initial cap of 14,700 in uh, 2022 and um, 7,250 7, in 2023. So that's, a, that's an update for Quebec and anybody designated to Quebec. Now you might have heard about the post-graduation work permit um, extension for those who were affected by the COVID-19 um, shutdown and lockdown and, and whatnot. Um, the post-graduate work permit holders who, are, who have pending expiration dates in 2021, 2022, um, are, are given an eligible 18 month period for an open work permit um, that they can apply for to um, re recoup some of the time that they lost due to COVID. So the minister announced that this would be applicable to postgraduate work permit holders who are expiring since September 2021. The program details have still not been announced yet, but uh, we expect them to come out in the next few weeks. So stay tuned for that. So any post-graduation work permit holder who has a, a, a post-grad work permit that is expired since that, that expired September 2021 up till December 2022 are going to be eligible to apply for a new 18-month open work permit um, with details to come on that. Now there's you know there, there's some difficulty with understanding what happens to those who are expiring before the program is announced and, and what happens um, to, to their status and, and whatnot. So contact us if you know anybody that's affected by this post-graduation work permit extension um, and the new open work permit program that's going to be available. So details are still coming in the next few weeks, but um, it's a positive program that gives um, 18 months open work permit to um, existing postgrad work permit holders. Another update is with respect to super visas. And as of July 5th, 2022, so next week, the initial entry is going to be up to five years instead of two years. And the um, uh, minister can designate international medical insurance companies to provide coverage for the, um, the, the duration of their stay in Canada. So super visas used to be a, a, a great program for parents and grandparents to come visit their children and grandchildren and stay for um, up to two years instead of the normal six months on, an, on a regular TRV. But because of the, the hardships and, and they want to attract um, more international um, immigrants to Canada, they are upping the super visa to an initial five-year duration of stay. So that, that's that allows for um, an alleviation of hardship of having to travel or extend every two years. And, and now it's up to five years. So that's great news for parents and grandparents of um, permanent residents and citizens. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a free trade agreement between Canada and um, several countries in the um, sort of the Pacific area. Um, it includes Japan, Australia, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, and uh, Malaysia, and New Zealand, and, and various other countries in the, in the, uh, the Trans-Pacific. Now, that's a great free trade agreement that uh, allows for professionals to 
enter Canada and obtain a work permit as long as they are in a professional occupation that is on the list of the um, eligible occupations for a work permit without a labor market impact assessment. So Peru has now ratified the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and they are now included as, uh, as, as a country that can use the CPTPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement Professionals category. Now, Peru already has a free trade agreement with Canada, the Canada-Peru Free Trade Agreement, which allows for professionals to come and work in, in designated occupations that are on that list. But the CPTPP gives Peru just another option. So it's another tool in our toolbox for any citizens of Peru who are, who are looking to enter Canada to work for a Canadian business in a specified occupation. So CPTPP provides an expanded list and it's just another option for Peruvian citizens. Um, and then finally, with some processing updates and COVID entry, um, as of June 12th, the United States has removed the pre-arrival COVID testing requirements for air passengers. As of June 11th until June 30th, Canada has suspended the random arrivals testing requirements for fully vaccinated travelers. We are expecting an announcement shortly with respect to what's happening after June 30th, but um, they are expecting to move the testing facilities off-site, so out of the airport, to make room for more processing of arrivals. Um, so hopefully all of the delays, lineups, and um, inconveniences that are experienced at the airport will be um, alleviated um, once the random testing facilities move off-site out of the airport. Um, and as of June 20th, the Government of Canada suspended the mandatory vaccination requirements for domestic flights and outbound air and train travel. So if somebody is unvaccinated traveling within Canada or they are leaving a Canadian airport for an international destination, they no longer have to be fully vaccinated to board that flight. It does not change any inbound requirements, so coming into Canada still requires full vaccination status, um, but uh, it, it does re remove that requirement for domestic and any outbound air travel. So those are some of the, the, the movements and, and things that we've seen that happened this month with respect to temporary residents, and I'm going to throw it over to Claire to discuss some of the updates on permanent residents. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, so June has flown by. Um, we haven't seen many, you know, concrete, actual changes from immigration this month. What we have seen is a lot of announcements for anticipated changes that are going to be coming down the line in the short term, um, mostly in the summer. So I'll just run through these these announcements and changes quickly. Um, in terms of the proof of funds required for skilled immigrants. Um, under the Federal Skilled Worker and the Federal Skilled Trades programs, immigration has increased this funds requirement. Um, they do this annually, so it's a pretty standard up, um, a minimal increase, which did come into effect June 9th. Immigration's given a little bit of a grace period, so candidates had until June 27th to update their express entry profiles if their previous funds didn't meet the cutoff. Um, so as of now, immigration is going to be reviewing the profiles. Um, the profiles will be deemed ineligible and removed from the pool if the candidate is required to show proof of funds and doesn't meet that threshold, because those, those funds are a requirement of the program for individuals without valid job offers. Um, and with the express entry draws resuming shortly, which I'll speak about um, soon, it is advisable that candidates go in double check their profiles and make sure that yours is going to remain valid um, in the short term because obviously having a valid profile is the only way to um, make sure that you're eligible for selection under express entry. Another change we saw was um, to the open work permit option for TR to PR pathway applicants. So you may recall this pathway opened May 6th of last year. It was open for about nine-ish months. Um, and with the opening of this new permanent residence program, immigration created an open work permit category for candidates. So similar to a bridging open work permit, 
Um, as of June 6 of this year, they've extended the maximum validity that candidates can request under that category until December 31st of next year. So that's basically designed to cover off the processing period by which they anticipate all the pathway applicants are going to be processed. That's a really nice change for those who are still waiting for their applications to be finalized. The other really nice change is that immigration um, created a new category of open, uh, dependent open work permits for spouses and majority age children of open work permit holders under the TR to PR pathway. So this pathway basically targeted essential occupations. Some people were working in NOC C, some people work in NOC D occupations, and they wouldn't have otherwise been eligible to use the regular open spousal work permit category because they weren't working in a NOC O, A, or B occupation. So this new policy allows spouses or children of open work permit holders in any skill level to apply for an open work permit. It's basically impacting everyone under this program um, so long as the primary applicant has an open work permit issued under this program. So double check the eligibility criteria here. If you are applying, if you're unsure, reach out to us. It is very specific, um, but overall it's a really great option um, for family reunification for these people who have been waiting, you know, a number of months, almost a year now for their pathway applications to be finalized. Another big announcement um, is the 2021 um, National Occupation Classification System being revamped. Immigration's been working on this. They do it every 10 years or so. And as of November 22, we're expecting them to uh, release a revised classification structure. So they're going to be moving away from the skill level, so O, A, B, C, and D, towards what they're calling tier levels, which stands for training, education, experience, and responsibility. So moving away from those letters towards t six tier levels, which are basically designed to reflect the nuances of training, education, um, and experience that's required to perform any given occupation. And with this recategorization, we're expecting that um, occupations which were in the past considered NOC C or D, so not necessarily considered to be high skilled, are going to be recategorized and eligible for some of those high skilled programs. So, for example, express entry may be open for occupations like teaching assistants, nurse aides, dental assistants. Um, and the reclassification to a lower skill level is going to be very, very limited. So overall, this should be a really beneficial change for people that are working in NOC C occupations. Um, and it's a really big change. So most immigration categories are premised on this NOC skill level setup. Um, so the, the impact is going to be much broader than express entry. Um, it could impact all the PNPs, um, open spousal work permits. So definitely a big one to keep a watch for. I'm sure immigration will really highly publicize this once the change does come into effect. And it's one that we're really, really anxiously awaiting because it's going to have a, a positive impact for, for many occupations that are currently limited towards their permanent residence eligibility. Um, I wanted to briefly mention an announcement from earlier in the month. Um, Minister Fraser has... Uh, released an intention, I guess, to create a new immigration program. Um, it sh details should be available as of the end of the summer. He's right now on a 120-day timeline to get details released. And the program will look similar to the TR to PR pathway. It's, it's designed to basically proactively anticipate um, labor shortages and fill them through this program rather than kind of reacting to shortages so that we're able to kind of manage those skill levels within Canada. And the focus is still going to remain on transitioning temporary residents, so international students, international workers to permanent residency. So when program details are released, of course, um, it will be a very welcome change to people who are working in traditionally lower skilled occupations, people who have recently graduated. Um, so something to keep an eye out towards the end of, end of August, early September, is this creation of a new immigration program. And then finally, the big one, kind of a hot topic um, in the past few months, is immigration processing. 
Um, so I say it's been a big, a big issue in the past few months because as, as we all know, it's been very highly publicized. Immigration is very backlogged right now. Um, despite that, we've hit the about 50% of the annual PR quota for 2022. We're seeing processing times under all of the permanent residence programs jump. So CEC, right now it's targeted at 11 months. FSW is about 26 months and the PNPs are 21 months. Keep in mind, those are all programs that are administered through express entry. So the intention there really was to have them processing on average between six and 12 months. So these numbers we're seeing are quite high. Um, family reunification is also higher than usual as are non-express entry PNPs. Um, so there, there are delays, we know that. Um, and now immigration knows that. So, so they recently recognized kind of the significant delays. Um, the minister has indicated that he anticipates restoring back to pre-pandemic service standards for most of these programs by the year end. So that's great news. Canada has also recently created um, a task force to look at the longer term issues here. So addressing immigration delays, identifying priorities, and ultimately focusing on kind of getting backlogs reduced and improving the quality of services that they're, that they're um, offering to the public. So those recommendations are, are highly anticipated. We'll see what comes of that. Um, and we'll see what comes of that kind of in, in the um, and the resumption in the coming weeks of these federal uh, high skilled draws through express entry. So we're expecting that as of early July, these high skilled draws, so presumably CEC and FSW are going to be resuming. As of now, there's about 8,000 candidates in the express entry pool between 500 and 600 points, about another 4,000 between 490 and 500. So based on how immigration was conducting draws before the pause, um, we would see probably about half of those candidates over 500 being invited to apply. Um, and we do still anticipate that immigration is going to begin with the highest scoring candidates um, and kind of reduce those, those numbers in the pool before they transition to a new, more nuanced method. Um, and that more nuanced method should be coming down the line later in 2022 as well. They're going to be changing the landscape. So no longer based on solely that algorithm and the score, they're going to be looking at economic goals, um, things like filling uh, labor shortages, fulfilling uh, minority language commitments, increasing immigration to more rural communities rather than the larger kind of metropolitan areas. All things of that nature, we can kind of expect to be more targeted um, in future immigration draws. Again, we're not sure when that's gonna be starting, but something to consider if you are looking at putting your name forward, even if you may not have the highest score in Express Entry, um, it's, it's, uh, things are always changing and they're changing for the better now. Um, so talk to us about kind of what we're anticipating and, and how you can best capture on those benefits. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention was um, the provincial nominee programs are still really great programs. Uh, as of yesterday, Ontario announced it had been given just under 10,000 spots for 2022. About half of those have been used now. Um, so with this news, you know, Ontario seemed to kind of be on pause or not really announcing their immigration draws because of the uh, provincial election. Now things seem to have kind of picked back up. They're now starting to reduce, uh, announce draws again. Um, and we do expect that they will kind of continue as normal as the weeks proceed. So something to watch out for as well is that Ontario PNP, we're seeing sl slightly lengthier processing times than normal. It's uh, typically about 60 to 90 days. Now it's about 70, 70 to 100 plus. Um, so certainly not as, not as long as the immigration federal programs, um, but just kind of good to keep in mind where we're, where we're seeing these processing delays um, start your immigration early, reach out to us if you have questions. I always say it's never too early to start considering your immigration options, especially on the longer term. Um, and, and if you do want to have that conversation, um, you'll know where to find us with our contact details. Yeah, thanks, Claire. I just wanted to piggyback off of you with respect to processing times and mention that the work permit extension processing times is currently sitting at 149 days. So that means that somebody whose work permit is expiring um, and they seek to renew that work permit or extend it, it's taking 
the Government of Canada 149 days to issue that work permit extension. And what happens is the, the individual will usually get what's called a, a maintained status letter that's automatically generated after the work permit extension application has been submitted. And in that maintained status letter, the letter says that the person will have status and can continue to live and work in Canada for the next 120 days um, regardless. And, and it says that the letter will expire in 120 days. But of course, processing time is 149 days. So there's an end date in that specific maintained status letter that is not rooted in any law or policy or um, regulation. It's simply based on 120 day service standard for processing. Because it's not rooted in any law, that letter's expiration date does not have any validity in terms of showing what the person's status in Canada and eligibility to work is. As long as they've maintained status in Canada, under Regulation 186, they are allowed to work without a work permit under maintained status. And so they are eligible to still live and work in Canada without a work permit while they are waiting for, for their work permit extension to be processed. Um, despite the 120 day expiration date on that automated generate automat automatically generated letter, they can still continue to work beyond that date. So employers sometimes get confused with the with that date that's listed on that, that maintained status letter, but just it, it's clearly not resting on any law or regulation and it's simply based on a service standard that is no longer um, maintained by the government. So if employers get that letter or if any um, anybody who is on implied status has that letter and has questions with respect to the interpretation of that letter, um, definitely reach out to us and, and we can provide some guidance on that letter. But uh, again, it's just not rooted in any law or regulation. It's really just a, a service standard that is impossible for them to meet right now. So with that, um, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, so we look forward to the summer and just a reminder that uh, over the long weekend, there might be a lot of cross-border travel. Um, and um, CBSA is reminding travelers um, who are crossing the border this weekend that you, know, you should be expecting delays. It's, and, and during the busy summer months when you're returning to Canada or visiting Canada, um, the CBSA is managing um, their entry a little bit differently just due to the evolving COVID-19 requirements, which could mean delays during peak periods. So they are, they say they're working with government and industry partners to mitigate these long border wait times, but um, recommending some things that travelers can do to make the process easier for themselves and other travelers. So one is to always ensure that the Arise Can app is completed within 72 hours of their arrival at the border. And um, ensure that they are eligible to enter Canada. So they must meet the admissibility requirements of being fully vaccinated or a Canadian citizen or permanent resident with the proper documentation. Make sure that they understand the rules around COVID-19. As I said earlier, there's no pre arrival testing anymore, but um, some people may be required to test if they are unvaccinated. And again, it's really, really important to ensure that they're using the latest version of the Arrive Can app, uploading their vaccination documents in advance and in, in the proper way, and getting the, um, the, the receipt number so that they can be readily, have it readily available to show the, uh, the border services officer and any ticket agent that asks for it. And also have all the documents ready. So permanent residence cards, um, passports. There's a huge delay for passport processing. That's a, it, it's, it's something that is known um, by you know, the government and, and media. Um, passports are taking upwards of three months for, for mail-in processing and lineups are wrapping around the block to get a Canadian passport. So plan ahead um, and ensure that uh, you have the proper documents in order to travel. And um, just 
be prepared to wait uh, a little bit longer um, at the border um, just due to you know the all the delays that are happening right now. Um, thank you, Kelly. So I believe that's all the time we have for today, folks. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And a special thanks to Kelly and to Claire for sharing their expert knowledge. Uh, if you'd like to discuss today's uh, topics in more detail, please reach out and book a consultation. Again, the information can be found on screen now. Uh, I'd inc like to encourage everyone to sign up to our alerts and follow us on social media to keep up to date on the latest developments inside Canadian immigration. And until next time, everybody, stay safe. Thanks.